bigger or if there are lymph nodes involved, we give chemotherapy afterwards to try to prevent a recurrence. Should we do the same for neuroendocrine tumors? So far, the easy answer is no, because we don't have a treatment that we're confident could prevent a recurrence of neuroendocrine tumor, confident enough to subject it to, you know, 500 people or so. So we don't have that kind of treatment. So instead, what our imaging is meant to do is just to find that recurrence so that we know when to treat or whether a second surgery is uh, an option. Do you guys want to talk about what, what you consider to be standard post-operative monitoring? Yeah, we've, we've commonly used uh, serum levels of chromogranin A or, for example, if the tumor makes other hormones like gastrin or VIP or pancreatic polypeptide and imaging studies. And the imaging study we've relied on is CT, but you know, we know that there's radiation exposure with CT, so we're a little sensitive on that as well. So since I come from the National Cancer Institute, where we used to image everybody quite frequently, I may over-image, but and I'm not sure exactly how frequently I would image, but probably every, it depends on the tumor and the individual, but every six months for like a, a couple of years and then every year after that is what I would guess. I think we do very simple, well, of course we work together, but that, that's about what we do. But because so many of these people are either cured or they're going to live years before we see a small spot, and even then they may live years, uh, we've been starting to switch to MRIs after a few years so that we're not con constantly doing the radiation for someone who might have a good 30, 40 years ahead of them. Uh, with the, with the uh, accepting uh, Dr. Kwan's suggestion this morning that CT scans are a little bit higher resolution for most areas, MRIs are actually very good. So. And so um, for a patient that's going to be having multiple surgeries, a patient that has a primary tumor and, and one or, or many uh, metastases, how do you determine how many surgeries is best for a patient? And don't, don't say check their insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a question of the sort of degree of the surgical insult. Some patients, uh, or actually not infrequently patients, present with a primary in place and metastases. Some of the time it is feasible to remove all disease at one setting. Uh, but there is such a thing as too much surgery at any given time. Uh, too many hours under the knife, too, ma too much potential for blood loss, too many sort of cumulative complications as you resect bowel and or liver or pancreas and liver, etc. Uh, so truthfully, we try to do uh, as much at once as is feasible, but we also have to balance the risks of that individual operation with the downside of the morbidity, and that, I mean, the morbidity is the medical term for sort of pain and suffering, and the morbidity of multiple sequential operations. That morbidity is not just physical, but it is mental and emotional. Uh, and so we balance those things, and it's very individual. Uh, but we still are trying to achieve the, the goal of leaving somebody disease-free. Uh, or sometimes we're trying to balance both surgical therapies and non-surgical therapies. So if we can remove the extra hepatic disease, it would allow, rather than systemic therapy, for uh, liver-directed therapy, which we'll learn more about later on today. So it's a balance of, of all those factors. Great, thank you. Dr. Visser, you mentioned earlier that there aren't clinical trials for surgery. So how can patients find out about the newest surgical techniques and options? Um, you know, I think, so the most important thing, I mean, surgical principles haven't changed for quite a long time. So uh, the truth is, so sort of newer surgical techniques, for example, uh, Progressively, for almost any uh, sort of tumor that we remove, people are trying to apply minimally invasive surgery. So that's thoracoscopic surgery that, or VATS that Dr. Merritt described, or laparoscopic surgery if it's in the abdomen. Um, most good academic centers are, are, con are sort of marching towards less invasive means to remove tumors. Uh, but, you know, it requires investigation because truthfully it varies a great deal from one surgeon to another, not even just from one institution to another. Uh, but I think all of the benefits, for example, of minimally invasive approaches, in fact, are short-term. They are significant because they, you know, mean much shorter recovery, less long-term, uh, sort of less pain and suffering in that period of time. But I think they are less important than the cancer therapy goals. 
And, and those tr are, are very traditional uh, and, and are done at any center that sees a, you know, this disease frequently. Well, I'll also address that. So in terms of clinical trials for surgery, they're very difficult to do. It's easy enough for Pam and me to say, well, we want to test drug X versus Y, and we're going to give 50 people drug X and 50 people drug Y, and we'll see ultimately who does better statistically. You, you can't exactly say, well, I'm going to do, you know, uh, surgery for 50 patients with this kind of liver tumor and then not surgery or a different kind of surgery for 50 patients with that kind of liver tu tumor because the liver tumors are going to look different and, and they're going to occur in different settings. So it's very hard actually to sort of standardize and do a prospective clinical trial. So that doesn't mean we can't study it and try to learn from the series that have been done and still try to advance the field, but it's very hard to do a clinical trial, prospective clinical trial for surgery. So this is specific to a patient that's had a Whipple procedure. So if a patient has had a Whipple procedure for a neuroendocrine tumor, is the patient more likely to get certain diseases down the road, and, and if so, which? Jeff, you want to take it? Yeah. I, think, I think there would be a greater, well, first of all, I think that if you look on the Internet, for example, the Whipple procedure has a lot of bad publicity because it was originally done a long time ago, and it's, you know, it's evolved. I mean, I think we do, we get better results with Whipple procedures now than we did like 20, 30 years ago. So I think that a lot of the people on the internet, for example, describe a lot of morbidity or suffering with Whipple procedures. Actually, if we've done it for neuroendocrine tumors, and some of the people are here in the audience, the Whipple procedure, they do pretty well. It's surprising. And you do have a greater propensity to have diabetes because part of the pancreas is removed. And like the liver, it doesn't regenerate. So if you got like glucose tolerance tests, or they might have a little bit abnormal glucose tolerance test. And then digestion should be relatively normal, but most medical doctors, if they know that you've had a Whipple, will put you on enzymes to help with digestion. So I think it's a variable thing, and you know you can actually do quite well with a Whipple procedure long term. And I think the tumor is really the rate limiting step on survival. And Jeff might not admit this, but uh, because he's too humble, uh, if you have to have that kind of surgery, you need to have it at you should have it at an academic center where they do a lot of them. And, and statistically, again and again, that's where the best results occur. Uh, and, now, and not just Stanford, UCSF, UCLA, USC, Mayo, Hopkins, Morris Sloan Kettering, places where. You have people who focus on these difficult surgeries, and not just the surgeon. You have a whole team of caregivers that know how to take people after such a surgery. So those, those are the keys. What Pam and I do can be done by anybody, <laughs> honestly. And, and so you don't need our expertise to take a drug, but, but for, for surgery you do. Thank you. Um, could you please address, there are definitely um, a lot of patients will talk about having surgery and then tumor seeding as a result. So when you cut a tumor, its ability to, to seed and to spread. Could you guys talk about what the risks are for this and if there are risks and what patients should consider? Um, that has been always a long-term concern. And it's based on some real-life things, but I think mostly uh, on lore. So I think it it arose from a time when we didn't have all the imaging and preoperative diagnostics that we have now. And it was, once upon a time, more common for uh, patients to present with a tumor that was in some way symptomatic, uh, go, undergo an operation, and then have the surgeon come to the family with their head down and say the tumor was more extensive than we thought, we weren't able to remove it, or there was findings that were metastases. And that operation it would often be timed with the beginning of the end in, in some way. And things would start to slide downhill. You, you were sort of puttering along with mild symptoms and got the operation, were recovering from the operation, and then in that period of time afterwards, the wheels start to come off the, the cart. And the family would attribute the acceleration of the cancer to the operation, and the effects of the operation are air or spillage, pro allowing the tumor to progress more quickly. Well, that wasn't probably to blame. Now, there are isolated cases where t different sorts of tumors can truly be ruptured, for example, in an operation and result in true spillage. Uh, but that is uh, actually quite rare. And in fact, most tumors are not 
fertile enough that it, even if they are exposed to other parts of the abdomen, that they, those cancer cells can actually grow. That is very infrequent. So uh, there are situations where surgery and the growth factors that are resultant in a postoperative state, your body is, has to give the chemical signals to heal the wounds of surgery, uh, can accelerate in the short term tumor growth. But uh, that is actually unusual. And overall, the therapeutic uh, uh, benefit from resecting tumors so much outweighs that that it ends up not being an important part of the cancer pace as a general rule. Okay. What progress has been made in growing new cells? So for example, liver cells or pancreatic cells or lung cells, and could those be used for future transplantation? Hmm. Well, that's George's problem. Well, of course, stem cell research, I mean, I think that's the future, and people are really interested in that. I think with the liver, they've been trying. The liver is an amazing organ because you cannot live without a liver, and we don't have any replacement therapy for a liver. So if you had fulminant liver failure, you'd be dead in two days. We've got, like, dialysis for kidneys. I mean, it's one organ that we cannot totally fail with, and I've seen it. I mean, I've seen it. I've been involved with fulminant liver failure, and I never really want to see it again. So I think the future is going to be like cellular replacement therapy, and but we don't have that available right now. And I think the stem cell research initiative, that's one of the things that they're trying to do. But that's going to be in the future. It's not in the present. And I'd say, to be honest, in the far future. I mean, there's lots of things that we have coming really right around the corner, and especially for, for cancers that are, quote, indolent, meaning we're going to measure someone's therapy over the course of multiples of years. The truth is, I would imagine patients in this room already have gotten therapies now or sometime recently that were actually not available when you were diagnosed with your tumor. Uh, and that is a remarkable thing about the fact that we make progress really from one year to the next we have new tools and tricks. But that, what, what, in terms of regeneration and sort of cellular technology, that is probably going to be measured still in decades, not in anything shorter. Great, thank you. For patients that have small spots on the liver, is there any way besides invasive surgery to tell if all the spots are gone, and, are gone or not? So for example, if a patient has spots that don't show up on scanning, but then when a surgeon is doing liver surgery, they find a large tumor, they remove the large tumor, but they don't, they're not able to remove the small tumors, are those small tumors able to go away once the larger tumor is removed, or do they need to continue to be monitored? <laughs> the question is, is it possible that removing the large tumor could kill off the small tumors? Uh, I fear not. Uh, so there, we try to do, sometimes surgical therapy and then non-surgical liver-directed therapy is feasible, uh, and, and both can be appropriate in combination. Um, and there, are, also I would uh, allow that neuroendocrine tumors can behave in ways that we can't always predict. So resection of the primary sometimes can result in changes in metastases that we don't always predict and frankly don't really totally understand. Very small liver metastases are not uncommonly a problem with neuroendocrine tumors. Sometimes so small that they're below the limits of detection, even of our modern imaging, which is getting better all the time and can detect things sometimes that are in the size of just a few millimeters. But it is a persistent problem that sometimes uh, there is disease that we, we don't recognize before until you literally have your eyes on the liver and can see these little spots that can be a millimeter or two at most. Uh, and then uh, whether it's systemic therapy or liver-directed therapy like chemoembolization or, or uh, radioembolization are required if that disease is to progress over time. Dr. Norton? But I would also add that I think this is from the patient's perspective and you all read your radiology reports, and I think the radiologists are trained to overcall anything they see. So sometimes some of the things they see, you know, they're calling nodules, but they may not be tumors. So I think there's variability, too, in our ability to detect these things. And sometimes if you're stable, it's, it's a good thing. And so, you know, you need to have follow-up imaging, but sometimes I think especially here in California, they overcall some of the imaging results. 
There was one famous mouse model where you remove the tumor and the metastasis disappear, but that was just in that model. That, that got a lot more press than it really deserved, and uh, there are very, very rare cases of kidney cancer where you remove the kidney cancer and some of the metastasis will shrink a little bit. I don't think that really is, is pertinent here. I think what happens is that you remove the large tumor, and we always know that just like any seeding process, that there are probably other seeds that are spread around, they just haven't had a chance to grow yet. And, and so it's not surprising that three, five months or years later you might find little spots, uh, and then you deal with them as best you can. Uh, what we need besides a good surgeon is a good weed killer, and that's what Pam and I are working on. <laughs> so. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much to all the surgeons for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. And also um, and to Yuri. To Yuri. <laughs> to Dr. Ladebaum. Thank you very much. <laughs>